Do you have one? It's amazing how many of us have a rocking chair in our house or a better place is on the porch. I just like having a rocking chair out on the porch, especially if you are in a place that's kind of quiet and not a lot of things going on and people to bother you. You can just sit out and just kind of enjoy nature and maybe some quiet. It's quite a marvelous invention, really. I mean, it's just a chair, but somebody got smart and put some rockers on it. And boy, did that change it. Because a rocking chair to me is just so comfortable. And maybe it's not just the chair, but a little bit of what it represents. A time of relaxing a little. Just letting the cares of life kind of float away. One of the things I enjoyed so much when we lived on the farm, we had a big front porch and we lived back in the woods and no one could see us and we could see no one. And my office was at home for a number of years and sometimes in the afternoon I would go out and just sit on the porch for a little while and do a little reading, some praying. Sometimes I took a nap. Okay, I always took a nap. And just enjoyed that time, a rocking chair. You know, I don't think there's a thing in the world wrong with a Christian spending some time in a rocking chair. In fact, I'd recommend it. But it's kind of a difference if you say that somebody is a rocking chair Christian. It's some of the same words, but now the emphasis is in a different place, right? I mean, good. It's good for a Christian to enjoy some time in a rocking chair. But a rocking chair Christian just brings to my mind... Some different ideas, some different thoughts come to my mind. It seems sometimes that there are Christians that are quite content to be a rocking chair Christian. Just to kind of sit back, relax, and not have a lot to do. But the fact of the matter is that in Christ, there is a lot to do. We all have a lot to do. You know, Ben and I have, have offered several lessons this year, kind of as a, as a theme, kind of taking off on this text here from Nehemiah, that he had a mind to work. And we've been reminded over and over again just about Nehemiah and the effort that he led rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. It's a wonderful story, and I've enjoyed just being reminded of that as we have gone through and we've thought about those things. Ben and I were talking recently in the last week or two just about as we've reflected on those lessons and we've wondered a little bit, I mean, have we really just emphasized enough that we have work to do? That in the kingdom of God there is room for all who are willing to be workers. And that we have to, like, like those people long ago, they had a mind to work. They picked up a brick, they picked up a stone at a time, one at a time, and they rebuilt the wall. It's an incredible story. And it tells us many lessons about leadership, but beyond that, it tells us a lot about those who are willing to work for the cause of, of God. And I think there's some lessons we can learn from that, too. I want us to go to the book of Romans. I want us to begin there in the book of Romans and in chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We have six passages today we're going to consider, and the lesson will be yours. Romans chapter 12 is an incredible story here as we begin the first part of the chapter. It's an encouragement. It's, it's an admonition. It's, it's direction for life that the apostle is giving to Christians like you and me. And beginning just in verse 1, such a familiar passage when he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren... By the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And the apostle is saying to you and me, here's what you have to do. That if you're going to walk with God, that you, yourself, you become a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice gives us implication. It tells us something about the fact that we have something to do. And what we have to do is 
as a living sacrifice is be holy, present ourselves acceptable to God. And I think there's a point of emphasis in the last line when she says this is your reasonable service. It's like this is only reasonable that he would expect this of us. That no longer are we conformed to the world, but we are transformed from that. We are now conformed to Christ. And that's what so much of the book of Romans is about, is being conformed to him. Our lives have changed. Our focus has changed. Even our work has changed. Because our, our focus is on him. Our minds are renewed in the work that we have to do. It's a call to work. And then he goes into that in verse 3. I mean, just like there was a call to work in Jerusalem of old, long ago, when Nehemiah came into the city and he rallied the troops, so to speak, to the work that was to be done. Let's understand that as disciples of Jesus Christ, we have work to do. And to those who say, well, you know, I've heard this. There's really not much I can do. I, I don't have the talent that so and so I can't do that and I can't do this to those who think that somehow there's nothing we can do in the service of the kingdom the apostle reminds us otherwise verse 3 for I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them, if prophecy let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it to our ministering. Or he who teaches in teaching, or he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberty, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. I have thought the list could just go on and on and on, but at the same time I want to say I get the point. That God has given to each one of us abilities and gifts. All differing. All, all different kinds of abilities and gifts. And whatever those gifts are, Paul says so clearly, let us use them. We have work to do in the kingdom. And every one of us can be doing something. If prophecy, prophecy, we understand and know in the first century, could have been by miraculous gifts. And Paul, when he says, let us... I wonder even if he's referring to himself in that, being an apostle that was led by the Holy Spirit. If it's prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Whatever ability we have in that regard, let's do it. Let's use that. Or ministry. So often. So often those like Ben and I are referred to as ministers, like it's a title. And it's really not... I mean, the word that is used here, ministry, is really from the, the Greek word meaning service. There's all kinds of service. And I will tell you in this church, we have all kinds of servants. And so whatever we are able to do in the way of service one with another, he's just saying, well, let's use that gift in service. He who teaches, let's be good about teaching. Let's do that. He who exhorts. Exhorting or exhortation is kind of interesting. Some people just have the ability to be able to help encourage, to lift up, um, to correct even in a very kind way. And we walk away being lifted up and exhorted. What a wonderful ability. And if that's our gift, let's use them. He who gives with liberality. It is, even as we considered a few moments ago when we give, let's do it with the right mind and the right heart. And we give until we know that we're giving something. And he who leads with diligence. The idea here of lead, the, the Greek text would lead us to the idea of he who rules or has authority. And speaking within regard to the body of Christ, 
I'm taking this to mean those who lead as, as elders or shepherds to do so with diligence. We, we encourage our shepherds to do just that. And he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, what a wonderful ability. Some who, who just know when to come in and encourage and lift up when some others are walking out. Some are so good at that. But whatever our gift, whatever abilities or talents we have, the whole issue here the apostle is dealing with and trying to help us understand is whatever gifts we have, use them. Be busy about the work that God would have us doing. Maybe they're on the same page or the next, chapter 13 and verse 11. Sort of a continuing theme when he says in verse 11, and do this, knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in licentiousness and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Our walk and our work in the kingdom sets us apart from those who are living and walking in the world. Our walk in the kingdom demands that we are looking at a higher level, a higher plane. Sometimes we forget about that. And maybe that's the admonition of the apostle when he says to us, wake up. Wake up out of your slumber, out of your sleep. Think about who you are and what you need to be doing. Because the time is now, the time is far spent, the night is about gone. Cast off the works of darkness and put on light. And the description he gives here is so very real. We understand the issues and the problems of sin and walking in the world. And he says, those are no more. You know, if put on the armor of light. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't even make any provision for the flesh. If we're busy, if we're busy in the work of the kingdom, we don't have time for those things in the flesh. There's no place, there is no room for those things. Because we have settled our mind and focused our minds on things of God. And that's where our mind is at. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, which I think is kind of a continuation of the thought that Paul just made in Romans. In Ephesians chapter 5, and let's see, let's begin... Verse 14, and therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Awake, he says. The contrast being, be awake and not dead. Sometimes in our lives, in our spiritual lives, we, we go to sleep. We become dead spiritually. And we're missing the things that we know we need to do. And we're not active in the things we need to do. And what Paul is doing is he's calling us to be alive. He's calling us to be walking in such a way that truly we are the people of God. Walk circumspectly, or what you and I would say is be careful. Be, be careful where you walk and how you walk, because we're no longer fools walking the way of the world, but we are wise in God, walking in Him, redeeming the time. Time, that element of our life that is just going and fleeting so quickly. It's just going away. Someone the other day just said again, as we'll hear many more times between now and the end of the year, and this year's almost gone. Can you believe it? No, I can't. It goes like that every year. We say that, have you noticed? We say the same thing. I can't believe this year has gone by so quickly. 
as if we're surprised. It's the same every year. It really is. Redeeming the time is the idea that we are making the most of the time. Because there's a lot to do. And we can stay busy all of the time serving our king, working in his kingdom. It seems like there's more to do than we can get done. There's a need of more workers. And there are many. There are many workers. The question that we have to have one for another is, is are we all busy using the talents that God has given us and busy doing the work that he would have us do? Or have we, have we fallen asleep? And we just kind of rolled over to the side somewhere and now we're just not as focused on the work that is to be done or even the life that we should be living in the face of God. Redeem the time. Use our ties wisely. Wake up and be busy about the work that God would have us do. Make the most of the time because there is evil all around, he says. And Satan has his way of getting into our lives, infiltrating our lives in such a way that he pulls us and he draws us away from the work that we know we need to be doing. But we just lose our focus. And I think what the apostle is saying, you need to get back on track. You need to get that focus back. You need to remember who we are. And to be busy about the work that he would have us do. You know, all of this that we're talking about requires activity. I've told you already, I like a rocking chair. If, if, if I could have sat up here and everybody could have seen me the whole time, which you can't if you sit over here, I'd probably just sit there the whole time. It's quite comfortable. My only concern about having a rocking chair up here is there's probably some mama back in the training room that doesn't think well of me right now. Because that's where I got the chair. There's nothing wrong with enjoying some time to relax. You know, a Christian enjoying the rocking chair, so to speak. But if we have become a rocking chair Christian, we better get up. We better get refocused on the work that we have to do. We better get up and use the talents that God has given us and use them in such a way that we are helping his cause, that we are, that we are lifting up our faith and the faith of those around us and encouraging those who are living in sin to know Jesus Christ. That's the work God would have us do. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The passage that Zach read to us a little while ago depicts for us the battle that is taking place. And I hope helps us to understand the command that God has over this battle. That God's going to win. And since we are involved in that battle in our walk in Christ, if we want to be on the winning side, so to speak, then we have to be walking with God. That's where we have to be. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we begin at verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments on and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now I read a passage like that and I think, and I think I want to make sure that I'm on the right side. Understanding and knowing the power of God to bring down all courses of evil. I don't want to be on that side. It's a spiritual warfare that he's talking about. A war against the works of evil. That's what's being identified. And here we have God pulling down the strongholds of Satan because he can and because he will. God's power is always greater than that of evil and that of Satan. 
our place in that. Our place is to be the warriors, to be the soldiers of God. That's part of our work in the kingdom. And when we think again about just the idea of us being active in the work of the Lord, I don't see any soldiers sitting in a rocking chair. You really don't. I don't see soldiers in a rocking chair. It's about the power of God we see in this text, but we also understand where our place and position would be and which side we want to be on. Back to Ephesians. This time chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Just a couple of verses here. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It's this metaphor again of being soldiers. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. Be strong. He says, it begins, it, be strong. As if he's saying to us, we've got this. Yeah, because it's not just about us. Be strong in the power of God's might. Be strong. Let's understand that when we are standing up with God and we are doing his bidding, when we are doing his work, that he is with us and he is stronger than any efforts of Satan to overcome us. That this is a, it's a spiritual battle against the rulers in the darkness of this age. It's a battle against Satan. And we are in this battle. Aren't we? Aren't we in this? We. Are we in this battle? Yes, we are, is what he says. The full armor is an interesting metaphor. I really don't know a lot about medieval times. I've read a few of those things, but most of it kind of escapes me. It's just not my greatest interest. But this summer, Sandra and I were someplace where we saw a lot of the battle wear of medieval times. You know those suits of armor? I mean, like the full suit of armor. I don't know how they moved in those things. I mean, I, I don't know how they had moved around. And then they put the little shield down, the slits that they looked through. I don't know how you saw with those things. And evidently, this was quite common because we sure saw a lot of these in display in different places. You know something I noticed? That in every display of the armor of those warriors of long ago, in every display, the armor was standing up. Never was the soldiers sitting down. Didn't see any rocking chairs either. That's a side point. Standing up. Uh, maybe it's because they couldn't sit down. I don't know. But it is not meant, armor was not meant to be worn sitting down or lying down. It was for battle. And when we think about this idea, this metaphor, put on the whole armor of God, it tells us something about the battle that we have to fight. That we are in the Lord's army. Our kids sing that sometime about being in the Lord's army. Maybe we should just all join in. To be reminded about the work we have to do, that we are in the Lord's army, that we are, we are waging a war against Satan and all forces of evil, and that God is there with us. There's work to be done. There's work to be done in the kingdom, and we need to be sure we are busy about that work and we are, we are doing that work. One last text. Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, oh, what a beautiful passage. Just a reminder, just a reminder about the race of endurance that is set before us and how we are the ones, 
those in Christ. We are the ones looking to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the one who is going to help us get there. He's going to give us the power and the strength, the ability to get there, as he says at the right hand of the throne of God. Then in verse 12, will you look with me? In verse 12, Therefore lift up the hands which hang down in the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be turned away from, but rather healed. Pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which no one will see God. Really, it's a, it's a renew, it's a call to renew our spirituality. You know, maybe there are times that we think we've come to a point that we don't need renewing. I'm doing fine. But I get the impression from the writer that, no, there is a time we all need to be renewed spiritually and lifted up. God says we need that. To lift up, to, to make straight the past, L lift up the hands that are downtrodden. You know, it, and if it's not us needing lifted up, maybe it's others who are needed, needing some help to be lifted up. Where we use our talents of exhortation or mercy to help those who are needing encouragement. Because there will come that day when we are the ones whose hands are hanging down and someone needs to come to us in mercy and exhortation and lift us up. Because in fact, in the kingdom of our Lord, there are many jobs to be done. And he has blessed each of us with some measure of faith, some ability, some grace to do the work that needs to be done in the kingdom. We all have some ability, some talent, some things that we can do. And all of these passages, the thing that just rings loud in my mind is that I cannot picture a rocking chair Christian fitting into any of those passages. If we think we've come to a point in our, our Christian walk that we just don't need to be so busy or we can just sit back and relax or even as I've heard from time to time, someone said, well, I did that for so long, I'm just going to let others take care of it now. Maybe it's the time in that case for us to look for other areas that we can serve. We can't stop serving. We can't stop working in the kingdom because the work is great and we have to use our gifts. And as the apostle said, sometimes we just need to wake up. This is the wake up call for every one of us. Paul said so, to wake up, to no longer be asleep because we are at war. God's with us. He'll help us in the fight and we need to be renewed to lift up our faith. There's work for all of us to do. There's room in the kingdom for everyone. There is room in the kingdom for us all to be busy about the work that God would have us do. The only question that remains is are we willing to work? Are we willing to be the ones that stand up? Are we willing to be the ones who are the workers in the kingdom? That's the only question that remains. And the only one that can answer that is you. We have to think and decide for ourselves, what will I do in the kingdom? Because the work is plentiful. And there's something we can all do. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to be workers in God's kingdom? To put our hands to the task. And to be busy about the work he would have us to do. And maybe even for some today. Maybe there's someone who is yet to even put his hand to the plow. Maybe there's someone who is yet to become a child of God but's ready. But you're ready, you know, you know that you need to be in the service of the Lord. And that begins with our sins being removed, washed away. Are you ready to become a baptized believer, a child of God, and a willing worker and servant in the kingdom? Can we help you in any way to obey the gospel of Christ? Would you come as we stand and sing?